guys, and welcome to Moms and Murder, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my best good friend, Melissa, who is not a shrimp boat captain, even though I just made her sound like one. Hi, Melissa. I honestly <laughs> don't even remember how you started the sentence off, so by the time you got to the shrimp boat captain, I was so <laughs> I thought it was like an inside joke you didn't realize I wasn't a part of. <laughs> it's it's an inside joke with me and everybody who has ever watched Forrest Gump. So <laughs> Oh, I've seen it. It's too late for jokes about Forrest Gump, Andy. That's that's not the smart part of my brain that's working right now. <laughs> well, that was a good oh, introduction. <laughs> Um, after this lovely nighttime recording sesh, we are going to be recording our episode for Patreon on the uh, documentary Tall Hot Blonde, and it's crazy, and it's like internet catfishing, and it's one of the weirder stories I've ever seen, and there's so much cringiness in it. It's I have a hard time talking about these things, so it's going to be very difficult, and we're thinking, Mandy and I looked at each other's notes from it, and we're thinking of posting them on Patreon because they are so... <laughs> whacked out (laughs) these are not professional notes but they just made me laugh so much so you can check that out at patreon.com slash moms and murder podcast um if you wanted to see what we have over in that neck of the woods on the internet whatever mandy let's get into this week's episode because i am rambling go absolutely okay so (laughs) so this week's episode was researched and partially written by one of our lovely listeners mary jane jarman Uh, she did a fantastic job helping us on this case and we're excited to bring her hard work to life on our show this week the case takes place in salt lake city utah where the murder of a young mother-to-be rocked the lds community and destroyed the lives of those who knew her before we get into the story, we have Googled the city. Melissa. We have Googled the city. Um, we qu- we kind of farrened the city. One of our lovely moderators and listeners, Farron, I, she's from the area. And so I said, quick, what do you know about Salt Lake City? And everything she gave me, I had already found. So I felt like we really like have some interesting stuff this week. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, so thank you, Farron. <laughs> But uh, to start off with, Salt Lake City is the capital and the largest city in the state of Utah with a population of around 190,000, according to a 2014 census. I'm tired of saying that I feel like it's a lot of people that live in a city or not a lot of people. I feel like this number, it it works. I, it's yeah, a number. I just, yeah. <laughs> I had no real feelings this week on it. <laughs> So the next thing about Salt Lake City, um, they are home to the world's first Kentucky Fried Chicken, which it's kind of a bummer that wasn't made in Kentucky. I was a little confused on that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was opened in Salt Lake City after Colonel Sanders franchised his recipe and restaurant, which was originally called Sanders Court and Cafe. Where did Kentucky come into this? That's all I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> or Utah, they're getting no credit. So speaking of chickens, well, I didn't even think about you in this, Mandy, but speaking of chickens, <laughs> I thought of somebody else. The biggest manufacturer of rubber chickens is in Salt Lake City. Nikki R. in our Facebook group, very active listener and friend of the show, uh, her little guy is like obsessed with his rubber chicken. Like he's yeah, had it. Some kids have a teddy yeah. bear. This kid has a rubber it's chicken. So awesome. It's amazing. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, man, that's that's where you got to go. Um, and our last fact about Salt Lake City is uh, the city of Salt Lake was actually originally named the Great Salt Lake after the Great Lake in the area named the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake is so salty, it's compared to the Dead Sea and is known actually as America's Dead Sea. The word great was dropped from the city's name in 1868, leaving it as Salt Lake City. And the words Great Salt Lake were removed from the lake's name in 2018 in favor of Mandy because she's so salty. <laughs> <laughs> That was a I was just waiting for you to make some kind of Mandy a salty joke. It was a very long way of doing it, and I'm totally out of any air in my lungs, but I did it. I, I made it happen. I loved it. I loved it. Perfect. So there you go, Mandy. That's what we know about Salt Lake City. All right. So getting right into the story then. Lori Suarez was born on December 31st, 1976, and was adopted four months later by Thelma and Eraldo Suarez of Fullerton, California. Her adoption was completed through the LDS Social Services. 
Her parents had previous experience with adoption as they had also adopted a son, Paul, from Los Angeles County Social Services uh, before they had done Lori's adoption. Thelma and Araldo were committed to their faith and had met as missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where they were serving in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Unfortunately, their marriage crumbled, and in 1987, they divorced. Lori was 11 years old at this time. The following year, Lori and her mother relocated to Orem, Utah, which is about 40 miles south of Salt Lake City. Lori was a spontaneous spitfire of a young woman. She played on various baseball teams throughout high school, and she loved going to school dances with her close friends. One year for her birthday on New Year's Eve, she flew all night to New York City with a friend. They didn't even bother to stay in a hotel room. They just went and did like a one-day thing of the city, which I thought was such a cool and fun. Yeah. Like, I don't know. That's just good planning. I love that idea. I would be so exhausted. At 30-something, that sounds like a terrible idea. But (laughs) as a younger person... No, I still wouldn't have done it, but good for her. So Lori was a very private person when it came to her own life, but she was conscious of other people's feelings and cared a lot about others. When Lori was on a camping trip in high school, she met Mark Hacking, and they hit it off and dated off and on throughout high school and college. Mark was the son of Dr. Douglas and Janet Hacking. Mark's father was a prominent and well-loved pediatrician in Orem. Mark was the fifth of seven children, God bless his mother, all of which were very involved in sports and scouting, and Dr. Hacking was even the scout leader for many years. Mark wasn't great at sports, and he barely met the requirements for his Eagle Scout, which is a big deal because in many LDS congregations, young men are strongly encouraged to achieve the rank of Eagle Scouts, and many families even consider it a requirement before they can get their driver's license. So Mark was often in the shadows of his successful father and older brothers, Scott and Lance. Scott became a physician just like his father, while Lance became an electrical engineer. There were high expectations placed on all of the hacking children, but these two brothers uh, in particular will have an important role as this story unfolds. So a little bit more about Mark. Um, His friends and family described him as a goofball that loved to make people laugh. After high school, he served a mission for the LDS Church, which is something that young men in that community do. They go and serve two years away from their family to preach the gospel and provide humanitarian aid for the church. Mark's mission was in Winnipeg, Canada. Unfortunately, he was sent home 11 months early for disciplinary reasons. And since mission presidents and other church leaders cannot disclose reasons for disciplinary actions to family members, the hackings didn't learn exactly why he was sent home at the time. It was later revealed that he was sent home for having an inappropriate relationship with a young lady while on his mission, which, of course, is a big no-no. They should never be alone with the opposite sex when they are on these missions. Um, To bring 90 Day Fiance into it, because you know that's my goal basically every day of my life. (laughs) But one of my favorite couples on there, like, that aren't crazy. I love crazy couples, but there's, like, two normal ones. Alan and Kirliam, they met when he was on a mission. And now they have a beautiful baby named Liam. And it makes me feel all kinds of emotional because they're just the sweetest things in the world. So there's 90 Day Fiance. I have no idea what you're talking about. I I basically, (laughs) sometimes I'm just talking to the three people out there that know what I'm talking about. (laughs) And hoping somebody will write and be like, I love them too. And then I won't feel alone in this world. (laughs) Yeah. So while Mark was on his mission, Lori attended Weber State University. She studied business management and formed a strong circle of friends. When Mark returned from his mission, he and Lori reconnected and eventually got married in August of 1999 in the Bountiful LDS Temple. In the LDS religion, marrying in the temple is one of the most sacred acts on earth. Couples go through a series of worthiness interviews, both together and individually. Marrying in the temple seals the couple for all of eternity, provided each person upholds the promises they individually make with God. After the couple marry, Lori transferred and finished her Bachelor's of Science in Business Management. She graduated in the top 10% earning membership in Beta Gamma Sigma Honor Society. Thanks for giving me that part, Mandy. She (laughs) She went on to work at Wells Fargo Investment Company as an assistant stockbroker, and she supported Mark through the rest of his schooling. Mark worked at the University of Utah Psychiatric Hospital as an orderly while finishing his undergrad in preparation for medical school. They were a typical LDS couple, working, going to school, and attending church every Sunday. Mark took the MCAT and applied for medical school and often traveled for medical school interviews. He even stayed with Lori's cousin while interviewing for a medical school in New York. He 
was eventually accepted to the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill for medical school. Lori was over the moon for Mark and couldn't wait to start a family with him and eventually become a doctor's wife. When it came time for Mark to graduate in Utah, he was super sick, so he was not able to actually participate in the ceremony. Lori and Mark's relationship was really picture perfect. Friends and family described them as being made for each other and said that the couple was very obviously in love and really took care of each other's needs. They were very sweet with each other and their relationship was a natural fairy tale. Lori even called Mark her teddy bear. The couple loved to laugh together, which is something friends remember them doing a lot of. Lori's family thought of Mark as a son and a brother, and the same was true for how Mark's family felt about Lori. There was no doubt about it. These two had found the perfect match in each other. But the couple's perfect marriage began to unravel on July 16th when Lori called UNC Chapel Hill to secure student housing for that fall when Mark was supposed to begin medical school. The university returned her call while she was in her office at work and dropped a bombshell on her when they told her that they had absolutely no record of Mark Hacking starting medical school, and they didn't even have a record of him starting school at UNC at all. Lori became visibly upset and left work early that day. A coworker had overheard her saying um, these things on the phone. Nobody really knew who she talked to uh, in the office, but there was a couple of coworkers who overheard her saying things like, um, but he's already been accepted and he's already applied and this can't be correct. Can you imagine so that kind of, information? Yeah, just no, coming out of no. nowhere. Yeah. And I think your immediate reaction would definitely be like, yeah, something's, you know, you guys have something wrong in your system. Like, you know, yeah, you would never you wouldn't think anything else. Right. You know, well, I think on one of the things we watched, they even said they went through and looked, OK, don't just look at the medical school, look at the university as a whole. So, you know, maybe something got their wires got crossed and it was like, no, there's just no record of him at all, which is yeah. insane. It, w- it would be very confusing. Um, and so she was confused and she followed up with the University of Utah where he had completed his um, undergrad and learned that not only had Mark not graduated, but he hadn't been registered for classes in three years. So in this one instant, Lori learned that everything her new husband had really ever told her had been a lie and Mark had gone to great lengths to cover up those lies. He often studied and wrote papers for his classes, and he even had Lori's mom, Thelma, proofread them before he, quote unquote, submitted them to his professors. He had never actually taken the MCAT and had never gone on any medical school interviews. And all of this kind of blew me away. And Mary Jane actually put this in her notes to us. But you would think that with all that he went through to like fake going to medical school, he could have just gone to medical school. (laughs) Right. He went he went to such great lengths and and even produced like fake documents, like fake you know, graduation papers and things like that. And so with everything he went through to cover up this like huge lie, he could have just done it and gone to medical school and it would have taken the same amount of effort probably. I still don't have my son's birth record or birth certificate and he was born five years ago and that's like a legal document. (laughs) (laughs) And this guy's just using his time to make stuff up like on a whim that doesn't make any (laughs) sense to me. Yeah, I know. So even after finding out all of Mark's lies, Lori never told any of her friends or family about their problems. But just three days after learning about Mark, about all of this with Mark, uh, Lori went missing. On July 19th, 2004, Mark called Lori's office to ask her to lunch, but a coworker informed him that she had not come into work that day. This was alarming news to Mark as well as her coworkers, as Lori had never missed a day of work without calling, and it was very much unlike her to be a no-call, no-show. Mark called Lori's friends and asked if they had heard from her before eventually calling 911 to report her missing. Mark told police and Lori's family that she had left early that morning to go run up City Creek Canyon in Memory Grove, which is a beautiful canyon that sits in the shadow of the Utah State Capitol building. It's a very popular location for runners, wedding photographers, families picnicking, and many homeless people escaping the heat in the city. Searches were organized by Mark and the families of both himself and Lori. Mark and his mother-in-law were frequently on camera pleading for Lori's return. Mark eventually revealed a surprising secret. Lori had just recently learned that she was about five weeks pregnant and the couple had announced the pregnancy to friends and family just before she had gone missing. Friends of Lori said the pregnancy was something Lori was extremely excited about and that the couple had been planning to have a child, so this baby was very much wanted and loved already. 
Even though it was department policy for police to wait 24 hours before investigating a missing persons case, they felt the circumstances of Lori's disappearance were unusual enough that they had started searching for her right away. When they arrived at the trail where Lori took her morning jog, her car was still parked near the front gate, but there was no sign of Lori. As the word got out that Lori was missing, friends and family became panicked and concerned and began speculating on what may have happened to her. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here, a brand new dermatologist-approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great, gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered, too, with a training pant that's ultra-soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. So at this point, uh, police had not yet learned about all of Mark's lies, and so they began to consider the idea that Lori had possibly just gotten cold feet about their big move to North Carolina, and it was a possibility that she may have just left on her own free will. They also considered the possibility that she may have suffered an injury or animal attack while on her jog that morning, which would not be unheard of in that area where there had previously been reports of attacks by uh, animals such as mountain lions. Another possibility being considered was that Lori had been abducted, which was fueled by what was um, at that time a recent story of Elizabeth Smart's kidnapping, and that took place not too far from where Lori lived in Salt Lake City. As detectives began to question Lori's friends and family, they learned about the upsetting phone call she had received at work just three days prior to her disappearance. At the time of the call, co-workers weren't sure what had caused Lori to become so upset at the office, and they told police how Lori had left work earlier than usual that day. Police looked into the call further and pulled the phone records to determine who had called and upset her, but before they could find out the answer, they learned something else just as shocking. Mark had just been committed to a mental hospital. So imagine like investigating this case and like you have this young woman who um, is is newly pregnant, allegedly. They don't know this for sure, but this is what they're being told. Right. And they have no idea what's happened to her. And now like... Th- the husband is being committed to a mental hospital that I can see how the police would be like, what is happening? Like, yeah, in this situation, like what is going on here? You know, and I understand like that it is a hard situation for him, but that's kind of like a big thing. I feel like to, to be at that level. Yeah. You're like day one and you're, you gotta, you gotta help here, bud. Like they're going to need you. Well, one yeah. thing I don't think I caught And I remember this story from years ago, like when it happened, for some reason, I was super fascinated by it. And I don't remember knowing that he worked as an orderly at a psychiatric hospital, which I found to be kind of interesting in this story that then that's where he kind of checks himself in, you know, like. Right. I don't know. I just thought that was. A he had bit of a right, like he, he knows had something about it. To that. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, I agree. So shortly after Lori went missing, police responded to reports of a naked man. I think they said that this person was wearing just nothing but sandals, uh, running through not a hotel a parking look. lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not cute on me. It's not cute on anyone. No. Um, so, uh, so this man was running naked through this hotel parking lot, ranting and raving, and it turned out that it was Mark. And so at this point, his family had him admitted to the same psychiatric hospital that he worked at. Uh, Mark appeared to be having a nervous breakdown over the disappearance of his pregnant wife. It turned out that Mark had taken to drinking alcohol, which is something that is strongly discouraged in the LDS community. And uh, it is thought that he had some kind of a bad reaction to drinking all this alcohol. So doctors, uh, when he arrived at the hospital, they not only found alcohol, but also barbiturates in his system. And they feared that he was actually attempting suicide. But that struck them as an odd move coming from a man whose wife was missing Um, at this point they don't know really anything about what has happened to her. And so, yeah, you know, it's one thing if you say, Oh, I just found out like 
somebody I love has been killed or has died. And then maybe you contemplate suicide. But so the cops were saying that at this point, when you don't know anything, at, your wife is just missing. Um, they thought that was a very bizarre You're hoping for the best. You want to be there when she returns. Like you have all this right. hope. But if you know something's happened, you might think differently. Right. So they began to suspect that Mark knew more than he was telling them. But because he was then placed on suicide watch, uh, they really were not able to question him. In the meantime, police learned that the mysterious phone call did come from the University of North Carolina, and they followed up with the school to find out more about the content of that phone call. And they learned what had upset Lori so much that day. They found out all about Mark's lies and that he had never been admitted to the school and At this point, Mark is looking a lot more suspicious than he already was. Uh, Everything Mark had ever told the police was then brought into question. You know, once the police find out that you've lied to them about one thing, they're going to start digging into everything else you've ever said. So he was not looking too good at this point. While Mark was laid up in the psych ward, detectives obtained a warrant to search his home. What they uncovered only confirmed their suspicion that Mark had been involved in Lori's disappearance. As they searched through the home, they found Lori's car keys in a kitchen drawer, which struck them as odd because Lori's car was found at the trail where she had allegedly gone running the morning she went missing. So her car keys are here, but her car's over there. Why? Like that? Of course, that doesn't add up at all. It doesn't make sense on anybody's part that <laughs> that you would bring the keys back and put them there. It doesn't make sense. Right. <laughs> so the detectives wondered how the car keys could have possibly been at her home unless someone brought them back there, which is basically what I was inferring to. As they moved into the couple's bedroom, they noticed traces of blood on the headboard and the nightstand. They also found the receipt for a brand new mattress. The timestamp proved that he had actually purchased this mattress before he dialed 911 to report Lori missing. Like, what are the odds that the morning your wife goes missing, right before you realize she's missing, you've bought new furniture? Like, no big yeah. deal, you know? Well, honestly, does any man go buy new furniture without his wife's uh, approval? No. Right. So red flag already. <laughs> So the police are, at this point, pretty convinced that Mark had murdered Lori, but without a body, they knew it would be tough to get a conviction. They knew they would need a confession from Mark, but with him being in the psychiatric ward, even that would be a difficult task. They wondered if he was setting himself up for for an insanity defense, so in a risky move, police developed a plan to make Mark confess to the murder on his own. They let him know about the mounting evidence they had against him so that he would have no choice but to confess to the murder— or keep up his charade and spend the rest of his life in a mental institution. Mark refused to talk and remained holed up in a hospital room. The police were no closer to getting a confession in the murder until an unlikely source came forward with some shocking new information. On July 24th, 2004, what's that, like 15 days later, Mark's brother Scott and Lance went to visit him in the hospital and learned some news that would change everything. The two brothers had a strong suspicion that Mark was involved in Lori's disappearance and knew the truth about what had happened to her. They pleaded with him to tell the truth, and Mark finally broke down and admitted what had actually happened to Lori. Which, kudos, because you see in these, in cases all the time where the family just can never believe it. Like, they don't want to ask questions. They just, and I, and I understand, you know, in some ways, like, you want to protect your family and stuff, but she became their family, too, you know? yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's it's I can imagine it's a really hard situation whenever you have like a sibling who's in this kind of predicament, because on one hand, you know, you want to support them and you want to be there for them. But at the same time, I, I, for me, I wouldn't want to see like my sibling like get away with a terrible crime, right. you know, and so and you want them to do the right thing and confess, especially if you, you know, you did know the, you know, you knew the victim and like right. you knew his wife and and everything. So I can see why the brothers were like really concerned about it and wanting him to tell the truth. Yeah. I heard one um, officer that said basically admitting this or like coming to the police basically put their brother on death row. Like not that they wouldn't have gotten there eventually, but they knew you know, this, it's all over. Like there's, you can't even pretend something different happened. Like they're directly, they're not responsible. He's responsible, but you know what I mean? Like without a confession, who knows what would have happened. Right. So Mark told his brothers that he had shot Lori with a 22 caliber rifle as she slept following an argument after she had confronted him about his deceitfulness. He told them that he had disposed of her body in a dumpster, which he knew would be taken to a landfill that very morning. He then took the mattress covered in blood evidence and threw it away in the dumpster behind his where he worked. 
Lori had never gone jogging the following morning at all. Police were initially unable to reveal the source of the confession and told the public that it had come from a reliable citizen witness. So there was some concern over this about um, since they didn't initially say like, oh, his brothers are the ones who got this confession. Right. Um, there there was some a little bit, I guess, of speculation about like who exactly did Mark tell this confession to because people were worried that if he had told this confession to another patient at the hospital where he was staying, then maybe it wasn't um, valid or right. it wasn't going to be reliable because, of course, the thought is like if one mentally ill person tells another mentally ill person something, um, is it – you know, can we trust that information as a as a reliable source? And so um, with the entire case really hanging in the balance at this point, uh, Mark's brothers agreed to come forward and publicly admit that they were wow. the ones who he, that he had, you know, confessed to. And so they were basically saying, like, yeah, we are reliable. We're his brothers. And he confessed to us, you know, not somebody else that was in um, this same hospital with him. Mm. So um, at this point, the brothers, like you said, they knew, you know, what this would mean for Mark. They knew that this was signing his, you know, sentence, basically, that he was going to get convicted of this murder. Um, but they were concerned about him more from, you know, we've talked a lot in this case about how they're they're very involved in, in the LDS church. And so they were concerned about Mark from a moral and religious standpoint and felt like they were personally obligated to help him um, make amends for what he had done to Lori. And so it's really hard. I, it really is heartbreaking because, you know, for them, it has to be hard to like turn their brother in right. and say all this. But there's like so much internal conflict with with that, you know, with like they feel like they they do feel like they're obligated to to help their brother and like to make it right and everything. And I just can't imagine. I feel so bad for everybody involved. In this I know. Case. And there's so many people. So first degree murder charges were filed on August 9th, 2004. And on October 1st, 2004, Lori's remains were found at the Salt Lake landfill. Mark Hacking pled guilty to first degree murder on April 15th, 2005, and was sentenced to six years to life in prison, which was the maximum the judge could give him under Utah law at that time. Six years to life. I mean, I'm glad it's to life, but six yeah, years. I didn't like the starter thought, sentence. Yeah, I thought that was really weird. To, like, uh, I didn't get that at all. And neither did Lori's mom. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lori's mom, Thelma, was outraged at the idea that Mark could potentially be freed from prison after just six years. But the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole set Mark's first parole hearing for August 2034, which would ensure that he would serve at least 30 years. The Suarez family removed the name Hacking from Lori's headstone and replaced her married name with Filahina, which means little daughter in Portuguese. I really hope I got that. I said that correctly, but I probably didn't. I'm, mur I'm not even <laughs> going to try, so I hope you said it correctly, too. <laughs> it's very beautiful. The way I said it, I loved, so let's hope that that was it. Um, on March 20th, 2006, the Utah House of Representatives passed Lori's Law, increasing the minimum penalty for first-degree murder to 15 years to life. So I guess, yeah, that was just their their OG sentencing from 1700. <laughs> was six years. Hey guys, as you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news. I love entertainment. I love it all. But sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details, and the minutia of everyday news because my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down, but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on-the-go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories. But the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's 
notes. It's perfect. Just search The Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. Mark's family believed he could not handle the expectations of his successful family and wife, so he lied to keep up appearances. In a statement issued from prison, Mark said, quote, I know prison is where I need to be. I will spend my time there doing all I can to right the many wrongs I have done, though I realize complete atonement is impossible in this life. I have a lot of healing and changing to do, but I hope that someday I can become the man Lori always thought I was. To the many people I have hurt, I am more sorry than you could ever know. Every day my soul burns in torment when I think of what you must be going through. I wish I could take away your pain. I wish I could take back all the lies I have told you and replace them with the truth. I wish I could put Lori back into your arms. My pain is deserved. Yours is not. From the bottom of my heart, I beg for your forgiveness. There is no such thing as a harmless lie, no matter how small it is. You may think a lie only hurts a liar, but this is far from the truth. If you are traveling a path of lies, please stop now and face the consequences. Whatever those consequences, they will be better than the pain you are causing yourself and others. Strong words. Good words. I appreciate that he did not come back and say, I didn't actually do this. Something else happened. You know, you hear that sometimes where people will give an honest confession and then they go back and say, well, I only did this because this, this, and this happened or whatever. Yeah. Not that I appreciate anything this guy does, but I imagine that it has to be very hurtful. It's just got to be painful all the way around. There's yeah. no good answer. I know. Well, actually, I agree with you. I read like that and I was, I I mean, I felt like it was sincere, like his, you know, this statement of apology. Like I felt, I feel like he does have some level of remorse for doing this. And I actually did see on, there was an interview I watched. I don't even remember where now. I watched so many things on like YouTube, but he was, um, you know, he was in court and crying and saying, like, you know, I killed, like, the love of my life and my unborn child. Like, I don't know why, you know. And it's just really That's heartbreaking terrifying. because he just got, like, to the point with his, like, lies that I guess he just felt like he had no other way out. And he was, you know, didn't know what was going to happen. And um, I can't imagine lying to the point where I want to kill someone. But, I mean, I... I don't know. This whole story just breaks my heart. I know you have liked this story and not liked the story, but (laughs) you know, I know you have wanted to do this case, um, you know, for for a while, and it's it is a it's a fascinating case, but it is really sad. Well, I think it's that I feel like we're just sad all the time now. Like, why is every episode so sad? It's the (laughs) mental side of this, or like the psychological side, I should say, where you there is no. She did nothing like not that anybody's ever doing anything in these cases. I don't mean that at all. Like these are all victims, but it just seems to come out of nowhere. Like it all was built on these lies. And at any point when she was packing to move, he could have sat down and just said, this is going to be terrible. And I hate telling you this, but you're literally going to find out in two weeks when we go there. And I don't, I'm not in a school when I can't stay on campus, when all these things happen. Like he had all this time leading up to it to just say, you know, this is what happened. And I think it might've been his brother. No, I think it was like a friend that I heard say, basically he was trying so hard to keep these lies away from his family. He didn't want his family to know about it. And then because of what he did, the whole world knows about his failures and stuff. So I was like, oh, that's pretty powerful. One thing we did watch is something on the ID network. Oh, my gosh. That casting was terrible. <laughs> Lovely shows that they put on the ID network. But my goodness, this was like, if you've seen pictures of Lori and Mark, Lori is this beautiful, um, gorgeous lady with these brown ringlets. I mean, just like really, you know. If you described her, you'd say she's got brown curly hair. They put some, like, blonde-haired lady in there. And the husband, Mark, he was bald. And they put some, like, young buck in there with, like, great hair. (laughs) But it was very confusing because I'm like, you could have tried here and kind of made it look. And the lady that he shows, like, kind of having an inappropriate relationship with in Canada had brown curly hair. So was she such a terrible actress that she could not be a part of this for even two minutes to pretend to play... 
I don't know why it bothered me so much because I've just seen their pictures know, forever, no, but it I bugged agree. me. I was like, you can't dye your hair for this job. You're going to be on the ID network for an entire hour smiling at the camera for no reason. They just kept smiling at the camera. I was like, all right. No, I know. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, that was the whole thing that bothered me about this, that like ID reenactment thing. And and so there is a 48 hours on this case. We were not able to watch that because I watched it years ago, but why. for some reason it's been taken yeah. off the Internet. We could not find it. Yeah, you can't find it now. And every all the documentaries on this case are very hard to find on the Internet. And so we did look. We did find that there was a 48 hours on the case, but uh, you can't access it anymore. And so I found this one that's like the reenactment thing that Melissa is talking about. And it's just it's it tells the story. But um, and yeah, it has interviews terrible, with terrible. Uh, detectives and stuff like all of that stuff is right. really good. It's just good, the but it's a terrible reenactment. And yet every single frame is just the actors standing in a kitchen doing or something. in a field or they're just standing there looking at the camera and smiling. It was terrible. Yeah, it's like but, drink a cup of coffee um, and then they both turn in unison and smile. I'm like, they are going to kill us. These <laughs> yeah. actors are going to kill us at the end of this. So like eight out of ten would not recommend that one. So yeah. yeah. But anyway, but thank you for doing this story with me because this was a very... That's one that's been on my list forever. Yeah. So, and thank you so much, Mary Jane. Oh my goodness, what a huge help this was. I mean, I don't really do the research or writing, but according to Mandy, it was a <laughs> lot of help. So, <laughs> it was so much help, and I absolutely appreciate it so much. So, thank you, Mary Jane. And actually, I think she is going to be researching another case. And for I us, so I can't. Yeah, wait. and I saw which one she got, and it's a good one. It is cray cray. So. Awesome. All right. So, Mandy, you want to do our last things before we go? Let's do it, Melissa. Okay, I don't know if I want to ruin your night or just kind of ruin your night. I'll go with kind of ruin your night first. Okay. <laughs> so, this is from Claire D. in our Facebook group, and it is, if you were to start a cult, what kind of cult would it be? Um, the kind where they force you to take naps and eat salt and vinegar chips. I don't know. I don't want to start a cult. Okay. Well, <laughs> you're thinking wrong. Okay. I want to start a cult and my cult would be very similar to yours. We would all have the same Netflix pa password. It would basically be a compound situation and like a sister wife situation where everybody helps with kids and laundry and all that stuff. Non-sexual sister wives. I'm not interested in a Cody Brown <laughs> situation whatsoever. But basically, yeah, we all have the same Netflix. We watch like reality shows together. So it's me and me, basically. Um, that sounds terrible, and I would hate being a part of your cult. <laughs> well, didn't say I invited you, so maybe this is <laughs> it's a new world cult that I'm making. It'd have to have a fun name because I like things to have fun names. So I got to think some more about it. But I'd be I'd be on board starting a non non sexual sister wives cult. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Um, okay, the other one is from Kathy W, which. Good job, Kathy. I think you've gotten on here two weeks in a row or two out of three weeks. Either way, nice work. But I feel like this is cheating because she said, uh, which office character are you and why? Of course I'm going to pick that. But good job. Mandy, How many? wait, where are you in the office, in your office yeah, watching this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have a confession, and that is uh, I'm just not into the office. Well, this has been Moms and Murder, and <laughs> this is our last episode, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a good run. It wasn't great. <laughs> this is it. Oh, my gosh. Well, then you know what? I don't even care who you say you are. You, who who do you think you are then? Who who do you think you are? You know what you are? You're Toby. That's what you are. You are Toby Flinderson. <laughs> I will let you choose who I am, Melissa. Toby. I really don't know who I am. I don't know the characters well enough because you know what? I watch The Office when I'm falling asleep at night and I don't really pay attention. I do. And then every now and then I'll hear something and it like perks up my ears and I'm like, oh, ha ha. That was kind of funny. But uh, I'm just not into it like you are. I love you. I'm just not into it. I'm just not into it. <laughs> I realize nobody can see me, but I'm just staring at the ceiling. This is heartbreaking information. Kathy, I'm sorry you, you finally broke this show. Um, Mandy, I'm going to call you Toby, and uh, that's going to make me Michael Scott because I am Beyonce always. But no, I think I'm more, I love Kelly, and she's so terrible, but I totally love her. I would love to say I'm like Kelly-ish, but without all the terrible, terrible decisions. Um 
just in the fact that I just love her. So this wasn't a good answer. You're Toby. I'm Michael. That's how I'm going to end this. All right. I will let you do that. Thank (laughs) you. Let me have this. Have a great week and we'll be back soon. Bye. Okay, guys. So one final thing before we actually get out of here for the week. Um, We have a couple promos that we're going to play for you guys this week. So the first one is um, a show that I'm sure many of you have heard of. If you haven't, I'll actually be kind of surprised. But it is the Minds of Madness podcast. And the Minds of Madness has been friends of our show for a very long time. They've always been very helpful and supportive of us. And we just love their podcast. We love them as people. We love what they're doing with their show. And uh, they have recently made a new promo. So even though you may have heard their old promo on our show before, we want to go ahead and play their new one. And uh, we hope that you will check out their show if you haven't already. It's a fantastic show, very well produced, and we just adore them. So check that out. Um, And then the second one that we are going to play this week is the Mugshot podcast. And the host of Mugshot is Lindsay from Corpus Delicti. So that may be... um, a show that you have heard of before, and maybe that will be a familiar voice to you. But Lindsay is doing an excellent job doing her new podcast. And uh, we really want everybody to check that out as well. So give these promos a listen and subscribe to the shows. And uh, we will see you guys next week. 911, what's your emergency? Every 60 seconds, a person is murdered somewhere in the world. There was a shootout in my house. I can't believe it. What causes ordinary people to do unthinkable things? He stabbed me in my neck. And he says, look how easily I could kill you. The Minds of Madness is a true crime podcast that examines the most disturbing criminal minds. We shed a light on the devastating impact these violent crimes have on the victims and their families. When you get calls in the night, you know they're not good or they're wrong numbers. You'll hear about the incredible strength of the survivors and what they did to fight back. I was studying his face because I was thinking, if I get out of this, I'm going to get you someday. Subscribe to the Minds of Madness podcast today on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. You've heard the stories about murder and homicide. But what about the rest of the crimes committed daily? What about the police officer who robbed banks during lunch or the multi-million dollar diamond heist? What about the assaulters, stalkers, and arsonists? I'm Lindsay, the host of Mugshot. Mugshot is a new true crime podcast that tells the stories of non-murderous crimes. Season one has begun and new episodes release on Mondays. Mugshot can be found on most podcatchers and on social media at the handle at MugshotPod. I hope you'll join me, but until then, be on your best behavior or you'll end up with your own mugshot. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.